very much for the um, generous invitation to come and join um, this event and also to have the opportunity to represent um, our SAGE um, initiative in Australia. I certainly do not represent the whole of the community, but I'm proud to be one who is associated um, with it. I chose this um, particular session to present in, not because we've actually been tracking a lot of success yet. Uh, we are aiming towards that, but we're at a point of our initiative where we really wanted to look to best practices in terms of measuring impact um, of gender equality initiatives. The SAGE um, Science in Australia Gender Equity is an initiative that is a partnership between the Academy of Science and the Academy of Technology and Engineering in Australia. Um, we are piloting the Athena Swan um, Charter and Framework in collaboration and partnership with the Equality Challenge Unit. Um, what I would like to present to you today is the journey over the last 16 to 18 months or so since the launch of the pilot. Um, I'll speak about three different areas, start by setting the record why um, we had embarked on SAGE in Australia, talk about why we chose Athena Swan as a framework to pilot and test in Australia, and then talk about what our aspirations are for benefits realisation and impact assessment. And I really would look forward to hearing your views and perspectives on this particular element. Um, I've got a few slides on data, and I hope you don't get bored with data. I'm sure this audience does not get bored with data. In Australia, we have the Work Gender Equality Agency. It was established by ACT in 2012. It is mandated to collect and report on data on gender equity. There are about six indicators it reports on. What I'm showing you here is a snapshot of their um, workforce composition in the tertiary education sector. And whilst it's a broad group of providers in tertiary education, um, quick message to take from this slide. If you look at the overall composition, you've got females roughly at about 60% of the workforce. But if you look at the senior management roles, a CEO um, and the like, it's certainly nowhere near that. But if you look at other roles within this particular sector of the industry, such as administration and clerical, you do see certainly higher representation of females. Another set of data um, taken from um, the university sector and the medical research institutes. And you do find that um, in Australian universities, the representation of women at vice chancellor levels is certainly less than 30%. Likewise, in the medical research institute directorship as well. Another slide that many are familiar with, this is the higher education data in Australia from 2014. Um, it certainly shows that whilst we've got some parity early on in the career, by the time it gets to senior levels, certainly that is not the case. Um, the STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, Mathematics and Medicine. We've included medicine in our pilot um, in Australia. Engineering is another stark um, comparison when you look at the overall data. And these are national data. They are not actually from one university or one sector. Um, so you could imagine when you start actually drilling down into disciplines and sub-disciplines at institutional and local and departmental levels, the picture looks very different across the various institutions. The message to take from here is what got Australian leaders um, and scientists to say enough is enough and collectively they came together and in 2014 agreed to look at the Athena Swan um, Charter and the framework of accreditation um, to be piloted in Australia and tested for our system. And this work started in collaboration with the Equality Challenge Unit as I mentioned. And the reason for that is that it was identified, whilst we might have the Workplace Gender Equality Agency and we have other programs and initiatives, which I'll speak a little bit later about, change is not really happening. Um, it's happening very, very small. The data from the Workplace Gender Equality Agency report card shows that it's very, very slow. So there was a need to do something systematically across the Institute. Athena Swan presented that solution because what it is about is really that system level change, looking at data, quantitative and qualitative, the deep dives, the identification of issues, and then it, trying to unpick the um, underpinning um, factors that cause the issues of inequity and work then progressively to put actions in place to reverse inequality and provide opportunities. Um, 
At the same time, Australia was aware that evaluation of the Athena Swan framework demonstrated that change can be sustainable. The UK's experience of over 10 years demonstrate that that is the case and it does make a difference. And whilst we don't necessarily see national numbers uh, from the UK, certainly when you look at the progression in the award system, you do see changes in numbers as well as qualitatively. What we're piloting in Australia is actually the institutional award um, and we are aiming for the bronze. The beauty of the Athena Swan framework, besides that it's a system level change, it also actually provides recognition and rewards excellence and performance. So it continues to drive organizations to aspire to continuing to improve um, on attainment level. So they start with bronze, then they become silver, then they go on to the gold um, and being champions really of gender equality. Um, so the interest in SAGE in 2015, um, when it was formally launched, attracted the uh, federal government, which actually provided support of $2 million over three years um, for three critical areas. One is really support um, the presence of SAGE in the longer term. So not only to enhance the delivery of the program as we look at what type of services we need to support our community with, but also to look at how we make it a long-term presence in Australia, what would the business model look like, how do we serve the system um, efficiently and effectively. If you're interested, the way the uh, SAGE initiative is funded, there are two streams. One is subscription fees, much like in the UK, and the other is subsidisation through the government funding. An important element though at the same time that the government was really looking towards is to what extent can we actually identify an impact of piloting such a framework within Australian system? How do we know that it is going to make a change and a difference to our sector? To date, we have 40 members um, of institutions in Australia, 30 of our 40 universities, six medical research institutes and four publicly funded organisations, um, including one of our flagships, the CSIRO, as well as the Defence Science Technology um, Group. These 40 present certain complexities, not only in size, um, but also organisational structure, the workforce composition, the type of services they provide. So it gives us a really good opportunity to try and understand how the framework will work within Australia, to what extent we need to adapt it to our system. Um, one of the interesting additions that um, we are looking at is the inclusion of Indigenous um, population, which is particularly unique for our Australian system. And admittedly, it was a tag on early on, but it certainly requires a lot more work for us to really understand how we do that within the framework. As we respond to our 40 members, we're trying to really look at how we best serve their needs and support them through enablement and encouragement, but also the type of support services they will require. And we do look to the Equality Challenge Unit. Early on, um, as we understand it, there was a lot more emphasis and support from the ECU in terms of regional network meetings and communities of practice. The UK's experience of 10 years have certainly built a lot of those communities of practice, which we do not have as much yet in Australia. In our system and geographical localities and distribution makes it a little bit more challenging how we provide those services. But in essence, we rely a lot on experiences and expertise from within the sector. Um, we provide opportunities for coming together, for networking, for support. What we do not do is we don't do the applications. We are not the ones who actually go and monitor the data. But I will talk about how our aspirations are to really capture the data that come in future and how we can use that to continue to demonstrate um, success and achievement in reversing inequity. To date, we've got some reported issues that have tried to capture a selection of, in terms of what institutes um, on the SAGE um, journey have identified. And many like what we've heard today from the various issues that have been identified, they revolve around various stages of a career pathway, um, whether 
it's at entry through the recruitment pipeline, whether it's about role models that might exist, whether it's the culture and the structure within the organization and the flexibilities um, of opportunities and support within the system. And more importantly, the attitudes and the behaviors that exist and the stereotypes we've heard already about today. So obviously I'm not telling you anything new, I'm just describing a journey we're going through that many of you have already been on that road. I think the challenge for us now with this identification of issues and reported what universities are going and proceeding, and you've heard Professor Rudd this morning talk about some of the examples and practices they're already implementing as part of their SAGE initiative um, of um, piloting Athena Swan. In Australia, we have a certain number of programs and initiatives that also cut across the work in gender equality, particularly in the STEM disciplines and fields. On the one hand, we have the regulatory requirements of reporting under the Workplace Gender Equality Agency. There are other mechanisms and processes within the funding agencies themselves, such as our National Health and Medical Research Council and the Australian Research Council. But we also have a lot of more funding um, policy programs to support um, women in STEM and entrepreneurship. Again, similar activities that go into supporting opportunities for women in higher education as well as in business. One of those, for example, is the Male Champions of Change, and I think um, also Kobe this morning mentioned within their institute you ha they have those. This is also started for the STEM. So you could really imagine how the, the interplay between what Sage Pilot of Athena's one and the programs that are also playing in this scheme starts to raise the question, to what extent can you actually differentiate an impact of one program versus the other? And that is relevant to the type of metrics that we need to really look at and identify. We are at a stage now where we've got some um, support research going into helping us to define this. And we're looking to examples from the Workplace Gender Equality Agency principles, which also has a certification program. And I know the Edith Gowan University has got certification in that space. It looks at principles that are very similar as well to the principles within the Athena Swan Charter. The difference though in the Workplace Gender Equality Agency, the deep dives, the self-reflective analyses and the reporting on that by institutions is not really how the approach works. So it's more of a tick box exercise rather than a fundamental change and transformation within the institution on an ongoing um, process. We tried to actually map some of those principles to the approach of Athena Swan and the central box you see um, is our interpretation of the Athena Swan approach. You've got the structure, which is about leadership and governance. You've got the human-centeredness, which is really about the people, the behavior, and the attitude within an organization. But then you also have the processes, and you have the consultative mechanisms underpinned by the evidence base. And all of that really feeds into the outcomes. Some of the principles in the um, Workplace Gender Equality Agency citation certainly maps into that. So it is not unusual to see that both systems could be impacting additively or perhaps wake at some instances they may not work together in the same um, expected approach. We really need them to. At this point in time where we're at is really looking at working around a set of metrics that will allow us not just to measure impact in the longer term um, and medium term, but what is our baseline? Where are we starting from and how do we define that baseline? How can we then set up um, opportunities to support institutions with benchmarking practices and performance across um, nationally? But it is also important for us to really look at a range of dimensions, so it's not one set of metrics. When I speak about dimensions, we're talking if it is at entry and recruitment, it's all of the various elements that make that. If it is about research, to what extent you take the um, you know, citation criteria, to what extent do you look at engagement into the metric assessment and processes. This is pretty much early stages that we're at and the work is currently in progress, um, working together with the sector to really inform what would work best. What a, one of the interesting challenges for us is that the three Three types of organizations we have, the universities, medical research institutes, and the publicly funded research organizations, they have different sets of data, they report to different entities. The only common 
entity they report to is the Workplace Gender Equality Agency. And that is also limited to some extent. So trying to align metrics that work for the three um, types of organizations is a big challenge, but it's not one that is insurmountable. I'd leave it here and I'm welcome to your suggestions and I hope that I've given you a bit of a snapshot about where we're at. The aspirations for uh, Athena Swan um, and uh, the pilot in Australia are great. Um, there is interest in continuing on this journey. There is interest in making it um, stay and there is also interest in moving from institutional to departmental and then progressing to the silver and the gold awards. Um, so we're hopeful that we will be successful on this journey. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have questions for Dr. El Adami? Yes, we do, at the front. Thank you. Vasily um, Nagacheva from the World Economic Forum. Um, and sorry, did, sorry, was that the question or did you state no, your name? I'm just stating oh, my sorry. name. Oh, sorry, all right, go on. <laughs> um, so I was wondering something now, as I was actually throughout most of the morning, which is, are you going to capture the students of these faculties within your measurement and within your assessment of impact? Because a lot of the discussion so far has been around the impact on professionals within STEM, and that's a very good focus. But when you start thinking about metrics, are you going to have that dual focus? Yeah, it has to be. So the Athena Swan, and I know the people who are experts here, David Ravain and um, Sarah dickinson Hyams. in the departmental awards, you do deep dive into student populations. So because we're doing institutional at this point in time, we're still interested in Australia to look at that. So students will need to form part of that metric. We've heard earlier as well, an interesting perspective. It's not just from university and I think what will be challenging for us to, in Australia to start looking to what extent can we actually see that outreach activity from university back to the schooling. Um, you know, one can aspire and dream that a model like this could be applied into schools as well. Okay. Do we have any other questions? I was told earlier on that I was too quick at concluding that there weren't any questions, so I had to let you think of it because some of you might have questions that come after a little while, so I'm giving you that space. Okay, I don't believe there are any more questions. That means um, that it's time to thank you, so thank you very much um, for your talk.